perfect song uh, to proceed the message today as we continue the two-part sermon series we started last Sunday called Radical Redemption. And as we've looked at uh, Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 9 are the verses that we're looking at as we talk about radical redemption. And we're looking at Exodus because there, there's a passage of Scripture there which the Lord is describing and speaking to Moses about what's getting ready to happen with the children of Israel. He is addressing them, even though now they're disheartened because Pharaoh didn't let them do what they wanted to do. God is reconfirming and confirming what he's already told them. But he's making it very clear. And in this passage of scriptures, we read in Exodus 6, there's some I wills that are listed there. In fact, this passage in Exodus has been called the gospel of Moses before, simply because these seven I wills that the Lord speaks to Moses in this communication are the things that are so obviously a part of the gospel message of how Christ comes and saves and sets us free and makes us new people. So let's look as we talk about radical redemption. This is part two of the series of messages in Exodus 6. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land which I swear to give to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and I will give it to you for possession. I am the Lord. As we talked about last week, just kind of a quick review of a few things that we, we dealt with, uh, several things in, in this little brief verse that he gives us this communication, three times God confirms his sovereignty and lordship over all things. Three times, and it's important that, uh, that, we, that we understand that because what is being told is going to happen to Moses and the people of the children of Israel is an absolute miracle that's gonna to have to take place. There's no way in any way that the Egyptians are gonna let these people go and offer any kind of offering for a short period of time or any period of time, and Pharaoh's made that pretty clear. But God is reconfirming to Moses that Pharaoh's not God. Pharaoh's not God, Pharaoh's not in charge, and you watch what I'm going to do, and it's gonna be with great judgments, with outstretched arms, I will do what I said to do. So that I am the Lord is an important statement that he makes as he verifies to him that I am the Lord. So we see in this passage, these, this I am the Lord, the declaration that he makes at the beginning, confirms it in the middle and at the end again, and then he starts off and he gives us what we call the, the seven I wills, which we call the gospel of Moses. And as we go through these, in fact, we got through two of them last week, but I think we can finish it up this week. He said, first of all, I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. Now we talked about last week in regard to the gospel message. For us, we know that means uh, what they experienced symbolically and typically uh, is experienced in reality for us in our spiritual life that the Lord did bring us out from under the burden of our sin. We're, to be lost, to be without Christ in your life means to be without direction, it means to be without answers, it means to be without any hope. And ultimately, the best thing that will ever happen to you in your own personal walk in life is for you to realize that. I need the Lord. I can't fix this situation myself. I can't change myself. I can't make it better myself. I need God. And what the Lord does ultimately is brings us to that place where we, we discover our lostness. We get desperate before God. And as we come to Christ and he takes out that burden. And that's a big burden. When you don't know what to do, that's a big burden. When there's no hope before you, that's a big burden. When your life is in absolute chaos and confusion and there are no answers, that's a big burden. Add to that the burden of just not knowing God, the guilt that comes into our lives and, 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 and it's a part of our, our, our sin nature. Add to that the fear of death. There's a lot that the Lord takes us out from under. The greatest day of your life will be when you sense the heaviness and the hardness of the burden of sin rolled off your back and you're able to stand up and breathe and experience life for the first time for real. There's no greater release, there's no greater freedom than to be freed from the burden of sin. David put it this way, mine iniquities have gone over my head and they are too heavy for me to bear. So here's this picture of someone bearing up under this great load. And what Christ does, he takes that burden upon himself and he carries it all the way to the cross and he dies for us. 
So he breaks that burden. And also he says, I'll rid you of your bondage. And he's dealing with this issue of uh, obviously in the context here of God's people being in, in bondage to the Egyptians. Unfortunately, when you look at the church today, just as God's children were in bondage to the Egyptians, there are many Christians today who are in bondage to sin and bondage to self and bondage to the world around them. There's no real freedom in their life. They'd like to be free. They sing songs of freedom. They read the Bible about freedom, but the experience of the reality of freedom is lost in their own personal experience. And they're like the children of Israel, needing deliverance, needing freedom. Now understand these are God's people. They willfully went into Egypt. Remember Joseph was made the, the, the second in command in all of Egypt and he invites his brothers and ultimately majority of the Jewish nation moves into Egypt due to the, the, the desperation and the famine that was covering the land. They seek refuge. What happens in the process of all this is the Egyptians begin to take advantage of them. Now understand, there's nowhere in history where the Jews posed any threat to the Egyptians. There was no just cause for them, so to say, to take them and to make slaves of them. There, there was no military threat from them. They had no uh, cooperative truce or treaty with, uh, treaty with the Asia uh, uh, that surrounded Egypt and the other continents there that, that, that could impose some kind of harm upon Egypt. They no, made no alliances with the enemies of Egypt. They were there and then they were taken advantage of and then they were brought into bondage and then they were made slaves and would refuse to let go. So you see a people here who are in bondage. Unfortunately, you know, we pose no real damage to this world, folks, in regard to we're here as the peacemakers. We're here as the one who bring life. We're the ones who introduce light and hope to the world. Yet too many Christians have capitulated and given up, given over to their own desires and their own whims and their own wishes. And as a result of it, now they live in bondage. And the Lord says, I will rid you of your bondage. I'll rid you of it. And then he starts talking about how, how he's going to do it, which brings us to the third I will. This is where we stopped last week. So let's pick it up here when the Lord says, I will redeem you with outstretched arms. Obviously, there's a great picture and type of the Lord Jesus Christ. As his arms are outstretched at Calvary and he gives up his life willingly for us and pays the price for our sin. This is where Peter said, you know, we were not redeemed with, with uh, corrupt things like silver and gold. From the old life, the vain conversation that we'd received by the tradition from our fathers. But he goes on to say, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Put it this way. <clears throat> There's a price to pay for sin. All right. You don't live in sin and not pay a price. All right. You may not pay it today, but sooner or later, payday comes. You may not know it today that's going to come, but it's going to come. There's a price to pay for sin. You say, well, what's the price? Well, if you read the Bible, you'll discover that the Bible makes it pretty clear that the wages of sin is death. So the price for sin is death. Now, when Jesus talks about redemption here in the New Testament and Moses talks about redemption in the Old Testament, there's a lot of similarities between the context and the concept here. To redeem means to purchase something, to pay for it, all right? Jesus says, I'm going to pay for you with outstretched arms. Now he tells the Egyptians that and he's talking about the context of receiving them openly and welcoming them in the context of Exodus here as he brings them into a relationship with him. It, it, this passage where he talks about redeeming them, it deals more with salvation even on their part than it does with deliverance from bondage. He already says, I'll take you out from under the bondage and I'm gonna deliver you from the slavery that you've been in. I'm gonna deal with those issues. But this goes to the next step. It's not only that the Lord redeems us and is it going to redeem them in this passage by, by ridding them of the Egyptian problem that they had, setting them free from the bondage that they were in, but now this is not just deliverance talk, this is redemption talk, this is salvation talk. In other words, I'm breaking those chains off of you and I'm opening my arms and receiving you to a whole new relationship. And this has to do with this, this I will, of, it speaks of redemption, it speaks of deliverance. I'll bring you out from under the yoke, I'll free you from the slavery and then I will redeem you. This is exactly, you know, what God is doing in their time, in their place. This, this is a gospel message for the people of Israel. It's the same gospel message in so many ways that God delivers to this generation and to the world that we live in right here, right now, where he says, hey, I'll rid you of the bondage. I'll break that off of you. I can set you free. And not only that, it doesn't stop there. I will bring you into a relationship. I'm going to redeem you. 
Listen to this prophetic verse in the time of Jesus that Zechariah gave us. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and he has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. Basically saying this Jesus, this child who's given unto us is the redeemer. Yes, he'll break the chains of slavery off us. He'll set us free. He'll remove the heaviness that's on our life. He'll bring us hope and then he'll pay the price to set us free. And this is where Jesus comes in now, the same way with his arms stretched out at the cross. He's paying the price for your sin. He's paying the price for my sin, the ultimate price, which is death. And he takes it upon himself. Now, part of this whole process, and this all works in, you know, in, in, in connectivity to, to, to each point that comes before it, I will take to me a people. Now, again, the New Testament parallels is very obvious in Romans 8, it says, then, once we come to Christ, we become children and heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Jesus Christ, all right? So we, we're brought into, not only am I saved from my sin, not only am I set free from the power of sin in my life, you say, what's that mean? It means I don't have to do what I used to do anymore, all right? That's, that's, that's where the Lord says, I'll break the chains of sin in your life. I don't have to say, but what happens when I want to? You don't have to. Your old nature will want to. The world will compel you to. I might tell you right now, you don't have to. Well, I have to. I'm an addict. No, you don't. Not if you're a Christian. Christianity overrules that behavior in your life should you choose to believe it and trust God for it. You can be free. But you don't know my situation. Jesus does. All right? You don't know where I've been. Jesus does. Maybe you don't know where he's been and you don't know what he's done. Because where he's been is through death's doorway and raised victorious on the other side of it. And now he says, I'm going to take you to me to be mine. I'm going to, I'm going to, you're, you're going to be brought now into this relationship. One translation basically says, I take to me a people. It says it this way. I will make you my own people. It may well be understood in the, most, in the New Testament context as this. I am adopting you. I'm adopting you. TOT translation says, basically, I claim you. <laughs> the CEV, contemporary English version says, I accept you. I mean, e any one of those, if you just stop and think about it for a moment, ought to go get you shouting. I mean, you, you just think about it. God says, I claim you. You know, if you lay claim to something, it's usually something of value. And Lord claimed me, you know, that, that makes me excited. All right. Because <laughs> I know the real value here. So if God claims me, that's grace. If God claims me, that's mercy. And God said, I claim you, I receive you. The passage in Colossians where it says, you are accepted in the beloved. Can it, can it get any better than that? You know, just when you go to work tomorrow, school tomorrow, just take a moment and pause and look at the crowd around you. 99.9999% of them are crying out for one thing in their life, acceptance. Somebody love me. You know, that's why, you know, I'm pierced and, tattooed most of the time and hairs are a different thing and all that. Most of that starts out in our young life and saying, hey, notice me. Notice me. Yeah, I notice me. I dress this way. I want you to notice me. I look this way. I did my hair this way. Notice me. You know, I, I, I did this to myself. Notice me. Saw a kid the other day come in, had the spikes through his nose and, you know, the spikes in his hair and, you know, pierced about everywhere he could be and a tattoo from top to bottom. You know, I, I just th started to go up to him and say, listen, you know, why don't you just put a sign on your forehead that says, notice me. <laughs> we want people to notice us. You say, what's wrong with that? Nothing, as long as you realize that the one who accepts you is the most important one and that you come to him to find your acceptance. You save yourself a lot of money and time on clothing and everything else. Amen. I am accepted in the beloved. Not only did he save me and set me free. You know what this means? It means he saved me. He set me free. And then he didn't lead me to my own devices. All right. He didn't lead me to my own devices. Because uh, if left to my own devices, I haven't got any more hope. That's tragic. A lot of people think that salvation is the end. Okay. Give your heart to Jesus. Thank God I did it. No, it's just the beginning. It's just, that's the starting point. This is where now we grow from. This is where now we mature from. This is where now we begin to find fullness from. This is now we begin to discover that we're, we're, we're redeemed. Yes, we're forgiven. Praise the Lord. But now it goes beyond that. God has taken to me, taken me to be 
in his family. To, he's taken me to be a, a part of his, 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 his life, his, his future, his eternity. So God provides redemption, but he also, not lay, leaving them by themselves, he takes them from that point on to be his very own. And literally, like it is in the New Testament, they're placed in a family and they become part of that family. All right? If, if I were to go out here today and adopt a child, do you realize that that adopted child would has more rights than my own natural birth children? Yes. Yes. I might disinherit my son because he does something stupid. Remember that. <laughs> Not like there's a lot waiting for you, but. <laughs> you took too much when you were young. It's another sermon we'll talk about later. But you know, my adopted son, or adopted daughter, I can't disinherit by law. You can't do that. You've entered into a, a different kind of agreement that you are bound to. This is the adoption process. When you are brought into the family of God, you literally become part of that family. You say, well, it's not my dad. If God made you, if becomes your dad by salvation, he is your dad, right. all right? Romans 8 says, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Adoption has taken place. This is that welcoming when he says, I take to you to be a people, my people. The Bible says you've been bought with a price. You're not your own. Glorify God now. And your body's been, why? Because you belong to God. That's a good thing. That's the most blessed place that you'll ever find in all of your life is a, is a freedom and an understanding about this new relationship that I am in God's family. And it's not just religion. And it's not just verses from the Bible. It is fact. I have been adopted. I have been made part of the kingdom of God and of the family of God. And now I am a rightful heir in the kingdom of God. This is, this is part most people fail to understand, especially in their struggle in life. They, they kind of feel, I'm a Christian and kind of left my own devices. I hope I can just live for Jesus and get by and struggle through it all. You forget, you're only looking at half the page. The other half is God himself. The other half is the commitment from God to be your God. It's like the, the Hebrew children. It, it'd been tough just to be brought out from the Egyptians and oh, well, you're on your own now. Have a good time of it. No, because the Egyptians are going to come after them. They're going to pursue them. And here they entered in this relationship. Galatians 3 talks about this being this, this freedom in, in, from the curse of the law. It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. That's that open redemption. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to Gentiles through Christ so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. In other words, we can be included. Jesus said it in John 15, engrafted, becoming part of the vine. Now we are part of a new life. You have a new family. It's a new life that you have. So he says, I have gathered you together now. You not only saved, not only delivered, not only forgiven, now you're part of of something bigger and something greater and something more grand than you could ever imagine. You've been brought into the family of God. You're adopted. Fourth, the fifth point is this, I will be your God and you will know it. You know, now the, the, the fourth one we just gave there about making you a people and this being God, the first three I wills that he spoke here speak of redemption, all right? The, the fourth and fifth one, they deal with this whole context of becoming part of the family of God and being brought into this, this relationship. He said, you've not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received the spirit of adoptions as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. In other words, you have this relationship and even in your very core and in your being, there's a context of knowing that I am a Christian, knowing that I belong to God. Someone asked me one time, have you ever doubt your salvation? I said, there's been times as an early Christian, yeah, I did. But the more that I grew and the more that I began to discover the grace of God in my life and the presence of God in my life and the spirit of God in my life, the more confirmed I was in my salvation that I knew that I knew. And even more so, God says, I'll be your God and you will know it. What's it say in this passage? His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. In other words, I don't go to bed questioning that because his spirit lives in me and it confirms with my human spirit that I belong to God. People say, well, uh, how, do you, how can you feel, you know, and know that that lasts? What if you do something wrong? And hey, he is a good father. He will not cast any of us out. He will not reject any of us. He has accepted us into Christ Jesus. We are a part of Christ Jesus. We're part of him now. We're part of his family now. 
and he will not disown us. He will not, he'll, not, he'll not disjoint us. He'll not cut us off. He'll discipline us. He'll chasten us. But if you understand anything about a covenant relationship, you will understand clearly that once a promise has been made, it cannot be broken. The apostle Paul says, even when I've been unfaithful, he's been faithful. Now he will deal with you. But I want you to know if you gave your life to Christ, it is a settled and sealed and eternal decision that has been made and is taken care of. The Bible says, Faithful is he that calls you who will also perform it. Another passage, he which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Over and over through scripture, the apostle Paul says, I know whom I believed in. I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him. Listen, I made a commitment to God. Sometimes mine is wavering. His never is. He's God. He will carry me through. Somebody ought to praise the Lord. So there's this assurance. He said, whereby we cry, Abba. I, I think that's the most clear, and I probably shared this before, but it still rings in my ear today. We were up by Zion Gate, you know, one day in, in Israel, and we had a group going through there, and been there different times. And I remember us getting everybody off the bus and getting them into where we were going. And, uh, this, this dad came out with his son, Jewish dad, and his little boy, probably six years old. And as they're walking around to the car, dad sends his son around the other side, the passenger side, and Dad's on the other side, and I'm kind of watching this at a distance, and Dad's taking his time getting the car unlocked and stuff, and, you know, the little boy starts wondering where Dad is. You know, the door hadn't unlocked. And all of a sudden, you hear the little boy's going, Abba! Dad doesn't answer. All the crowd's going on. Abba! Still no answer. Abba! <laughs> and Dad ran over to him. I'm getting the car unlocked. But I thought, well, this, that's, that's the ringing sound of, of love and, you know, the... The, the cry to a father, it's, it's dad, dad, dad. That's, that's the passion that's being cried out in this verse. There's this commitment, there's this relationship that cannot be severed. It goes deeper even than flesh and blood. It's the spirit of God in you that has united you to a heavenly father and he is your father. With that comes grace and protection and provision and privilege. This New Testament is filled with the, the beauty of this relationship where God says, I'll be your God and you'll call me Father. That's powerful. That's incredible to realize that that kind of commitment from all too often, I think we get so preoccupied with, I just hope he's committed enough. We need to realize his commitment is great. And what he's saying here, in, in the context, I really believe with the, uh, even of the Hebrew connotation here is this, we're going to have this one-on-one -on -one relationship. I'm going to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you as a people. You know, I'm committed to you. I love it. It says, and you will know. This simply means to know by experience. That's what the word comes down to meaning. You're going to know by experience. How do I know by experience? I see over and over. It went open my eyes long enough to see the grace of God. How often God has been so gracious to me. I know it by experience when I begin to fail the grace of God, how God deals with me and disciplines me and chastens me, brings me back in the right relationship with him. I know it by experience when the difficulties and the trials and the sadness and the grief and the sorrow, different occasions in my life of deep hurt and pain, when God has stepped in and shown himself mighty in my life, I know it by experience. And so do you. When you take time to notice it, all too often we sit back like immature children and say, where's God? And if we just be honest, he's right there in the midst. And this is the promise of this passage. I'll be there. I'll be there. And you'll know it. And he gets into this. As he goes through, he says, you know, I'll take you to my people. I'll be your God. You will know it. And then he gets to this, I will bring you to a land. And he does. Now, as Christians, first of all, we experience this new land. If we're going to talk about types and symbols from the Old Testament to the New Testament, then this, this land of Canaan for us is this new life. We have a transformed life. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. If we come to Christ, the old man passes away and we become new people in Christ Jesus. And we now live, God's our father, we're in his kingdom. We're part of his families. We're joined us with Jesus. We serve as citizens in the kingdom of God. We're priests. On and on the list could go of the way God describes us in this new life and in this new land. Now the plan 
for God and for his people was to bring them out of Egypt to cross the wilderness, bring them up to the river Jordan and cross the Jordan and go into the land of Canaan to possess it. That was the plan. We know that didn't work out, right? Was that God's fault? No, God had to deal with them. So they come in, they get to the Jordan finally, and they get there and they refuse to cross. They don't go in and possess the land. And as a result of it, they're sent back into the wilderness to wander for 40 years until that whole generation but two men die in the wilderness. What a sad lesson to learn. What a hard lesson. The idea for us as Christians is, too many Christians, when they get into this new life of following Jesus, surrendered my heart to him, gave my life to Christ, I am saved, we're called to be disciples. And we start this journey and this process until we get up to the River Jordan, and it could be anything. All right, Jordan can re ultimately represents our self. Crossing means we're willing to die to ourselves. And all too often we get up to the Jordan's banks and we begin to negotiate. We begin to justify. We begin to rationalize or excuse and to come up with every reason why we don't want to die to ourselves and make that decision and go on to walk with God in a deeper way. It represents, Canaan does, that life of surrendered heart, a spirit-filled life, the life of enjoying the will of God and walking in the will of God. But all too often, the majority of folks, just as they did then, come up to the Jordan and turn around, and they don't go in and possess the land, the new life, the fullness of life. And they wander around, complaining, blaming God, griping, defeated. Live, oh, God's meeting their needs. I was saying he fed them every day. The shoes didn't wear out. The clothes didn't wear out. They went through the process, but they're just, they're just living a, an existence with the name Jesus on it. They have every possibility of having a life that means much more and can go much deeper, but they don't experience it because they're too preoccupied with the wilderness and themselves. And they just miss the deeper life, the deeper meaning of life, and the deeper joy and the peace that God gives. God says, that, that's not my will for, for us to stop here. I've taken you out. I'm meeting you here. As I said, I'm going to, I'm going to take you to be a people. I'm going to take ownership of this. We're going to move together and we're going to move forward to the fullness of life. You have freedom from Pharaoh, freedom from the bondage, taking you to the land that flows with milk and honey. You say, well, doesn't Canaan represent heaven? No, Canaan does not represent heaven. Because Canaan was a land still filled with battles. They have to cross over. They got to face Jericho. They got to deal with the Amalekites, all the other people, the different parts of the world. You know, they got to go up to then conquer all these different regions of the promised land. And so there are still battles to be fought even as you cross the Jordan. There's still a fight. There's still, there's still battles. But you're walking in victory. And you're walking towards victory. And you're walking in a position of victory. The problem is people would rather live in the wilderness and be defeated. The Lord said, I'm taking you to this place and I'm giving you this land. I'm going to give you what you need while you're in the land. So it leads us to the new life, the kingdom of God, living in the kingdom. But that's, that doesn't end there. He says, I will give it to you as a possession. Now, I think in the context of the gospel of present day versus the gospel of Moses, to give it to us as a possession, I think ultimately we're talking about the eternal possession. We're talking about the everlasting life. We know one day, Everybody in this room is either going to die or if you're a saint, you're going to be raptured. All right? That day's coming. Mark it down. Yeah, I mean, go ahead and tell the person side, you're going to die. <laughs> it's going to happen. Unless Jesus comes, which is the stage is set for that as well, by the rapture to take us into this eternal possession with God. And John, uh, Pete Lozano, who did his funeral just a couple weeks ago, I shared this passage from John 14. We talked about do not let your heart be troubled. Uh, this has probably been preached from more than any other chapter and verse in the Bible for funerals than any other passage I know of. And a lot of pastors have shared grieving with grieving families the, the excitement on one set level, on one side of eternity where those who do know the Lord have gone on to be with the Lord, the present to be absent with the body, to be present with the Lord. And they share from this passage. Well, you know, the Lord's prepared a place and I guess he had their house ready so he came and he got them. And so this becomes a great funeral passage. But this isn't, this isn't a funeral verse. This is a wedding verse. Brother Tim be preaching on the Jewish wedding starting this, this Wednesday night, didn't it? We, you, you start. Last Wednesday. So if you missed it, see, I missed it. I was somewhere else. I was preaching somewhere else. But it's, it's a tremendous series about how this whole relationship between us coming to Christ and be part of, be, becoming part of his bride, 
and how that carries out and how that translates and all the Hebrew wedding translates prophetically into everything that happens to the believer in our spiritual walk of life. Well, the Lord is preparing a place for his bride. There is a day coming when he will come and get us. The one thing that had to happen was that the, that the groom went and prepared the place for the bride before the wedding could be completed that had to be done. All right? So Jesus is preparing this place for us. This isn't about a funeral. It's about a time when the bride is received by the groom to be taken into their new dwelling place for all eternity to live together. One big happy family. All right? This is the truly only place in history where you find they live happily ever after. All right? This is it. In John 14, there's this great wedding passage where he says, I'm going to go prepare that place. And just as the groom promises, I'm going to come and I'm going to bring you that place that where I am, you may be also. Let me just say that one more time. That where I am, you may be also. Why? Because you were made to be with him. That's what salvation's really all about. That's what the marriage is all about. That's what the relationship is all about. So you could be with Jesus. When I gave my life to Christ, guess what happened? I got to be with Jesus. His spirit comes into my life. But the day is coming by death or by rapture that I'm going to be with Jesus, literally with Jesus, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And with all the saints who've gone before me and all those who are coming after me, I'm going to be with Jesus. That's praise the Lord worthy, is it not? I'm going to be with Christ. That might not be exciting for you. You're not me. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm going to be with the Lord forever. Now, this is, this is just, uh, just the golden jewel, so to say. Now, that's why the scripture tells us, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of a saint. That's a good thing in God's eyes. We don't think it's a good thing on this side. We miss people. We love people. We care about them. We want their fellowship. We want the relationship continued. Hey, but God says, that's... Over on your side, that's not what it's all about. What it's all about is what's happening over here. And what's happening over here is for you to come into my presence, into this family. This, this is why Jesus died, folks. This is why the crucifixion. This is why the resurrection. So that you could be where the Lord is. That's the heart of God's love for you. That's the power of the gospel that should appeal to you and draw to you. You can be with God forever and ever. All authority, all power is his. I mean, he closes this, this, this anthem of, of verses up with, I am the Lord. In the middle, he texts it, I am the Lord. On the end, I am the Lord. Why? Because, hey, all this may seem impossible, but it becomes possible because I'm the Lord. I'm the Lord. What I say, I will do. What I promise, I will fulfill. I'm the Lord. If I'm going to prepare a place for you, I wouldn't tell you if it were not true. It's the truth. Don't you love the way it's just written out so clearly? I wouldn't tell you this if I were I, I'm lying to you, basically is what he's saying. I'm not lying to you. It's not a fairy tale. I didn't make this up on the side. <laughs> I will come and receive you unto myself. I am the Lord. Which means the possibility is certainly there. If the promise is there, then you can expect it to be fulfilled. I can't imagine. If you're here today and you've never really made a commitment to your life to Christ, what, what are you living for? Even now, much less in eternity, you've got nothing. You may have surrounded yourself with some fine friends and family, and that's all well and good. But hey, you're, you're spiritually, your tank's empty. The Bible says we're dead in our trespasses and sin. And you have a God who demonstrated his vast love for you by, said, by sending his son to die for you on the cross. If you're sitting back and saying, I don't know if God loves me, just read the history books. He died on the cross for you. Read the scriptures that he rose from the dead so that you could have life now and life in the future. You've got, you've got nothing like that. It's hard to do funerals for people who, who don't know the Lord for this very reason. They have no hope. As I shared with you last Wednesday, I mean last Sunday, I mean, the one thing I wanted you to leave this message with today was just walk out of here realizing you have a sure hope. Sure, Brother Joe, things are hard in my life. You have hope. Things are difficult right now. You have hope. I'm having problems with my family. You have hope. I'm going to have difficulty in my family. You have hope. I'm, I'm facing some severe news from the doctor. You have hope. I, you know, the, the times are hard. I may even not have a job. Now. You have hope. If you have God and Christ, Jesus is in your life, you have everything in the world to be excited about. Do not let the doom, the gloom, the despair of this generation and of this world and especially of this culture drive you to despair. 
Paul said, we don't even grieve like those people who have no hope when we grieve for our lost loved ones. Why? He says, because we have hope in a resurrection. Jesus is coming. Final curtains are being drawn. I mean, the credits are about to roll. Amen. It'll say something like, Director, Lord Jesus, Author, God the Father, <laughs> Script, Holy Spirit, the Word of God. Bottle slide, to God be the glory. That's worth that point. Never before has history taken on the shape as it has today. Never before has it been more clear to the church that we are living in the last days than it is this day that we live in. Never in time in history has everything been done so clearly, definitively, according to as it would be described in Scripture about the end times as it is in these times. Jesus is coming. We are very near the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation is upon us. The days that the Scripture talks about right prior to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're in the middle of those days. The days of the world powers that the Bible talks about in the Old Testament, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, those powers are in place today. The nations that would be prominent in the world, the Islamic rise, all those things are prophesied in Scripture. When you see the war against Israel, Gog and Magog, not Armageddon, but prior to the rapture, about the same time as the rapture, and the nations within that list of nations, there are all those nations that are out there. Many of them are break-offs of the, of the USSR, the old Soviet Republic. Most of those nations that split off and became independent nations, majority of them are Islamic nations. And you see a relationship still being fostered by the Russians today that's described in that relationship in Ezekiel. Putin was recently deemed the protector of Islam in major newspapers around the world. Jesus is coming. You better get ready. <laughs> the day is upon us. Hallelujah. These are the most exciting times to live in. And here we are. God's placed us here for such a time as this. I would encourage you today to receive the hope that is yours in Christ. One, maybe you're here without Christ today. I had a lady come forward at the other campus this morning and said, I cannot live another day without God in my life. Broken. She got there 30 minutes before church started. She had one thing on her mind, I need to get right with God. The invitation came, she didn't hesitate. I need to talk to somebody about Jesus. Maybe that's you today. Could be your Baptist assembly, could be your Methodist, Catholic, whatever. Hey, that's not going to carry you very far in eternity. You need to be born again. If you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you're trusting religion, if you're trusting some little steps you took, you trust Jesus. That's the answer to salvation. If you've never trusted Christ for your life, forgiving you of your sins, and come into your heart and life, then today's the day to do that. Give your heart and your life to Christ. If you're a Christian and you know your life is not right, if the Lord were to show up today and you'd be embarrassed, then I would not leave that way. I'd leave right with God today. I'd get my heart right. I'd claim the promise of 1 John 1, 9. If amen confesses, forsakes his sins, where it talks about that God is faithful and is just to forgive us if we confess our sins. I'd lay those things on the altar this morning, walk out of this place right with God in a spirit of renewal and revival if I were you. Don't hesitate. Today is the day of salvation. If God's dealing with your heart about something, then now's the time to deal with it. I want you to stand with me if you would. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer.